OK, today we're looking at comparison contrast essays. This unit is not in your textbook. For some very strange reason, a very basic skill that is not in our textbook. So please pay close attention. A comparison contrast essay, like an exposition essay, like a cause effect essay, has an introduction, a main body, and a conclusion. The conclusion, uh, again, very similar, tells your reader what they should take away from this essay, and it pushes them to the future. What can you do with this information? How has this information changed you as a reader? The main body of the essay is where you do the comparing and the contrasting. Compare and contrast are two different things. To compare means to show how two things are similar. To contrast means to show how they are different. So there are two main ways you can write a comparison contrast essay. The first way is you spend all of the first half of your essay talking about one thing, and then all of the second half of your essay talking about the other thing. If you use this method, try to remember that you are still comparing them. So even when you're writing your second paragraph, you should still sometimes refer to your first paragraph. So unlike something something or in contrast to something something or similar to something something you still have to compare the two things the other main strategy is think about these two things what are you comparing them about what specific points of comparison are you using for example if you want to compare two classes you might think the first thing you want to compare is the two teachers. Like how are they similar? How are they different? The second thing you might want to compare is uh, what kind of textbook are you using? The third thing might be what is the classroom atmosphere like? What does it feel like to take these classes? Each one of these is a point of comparison. And so you would spend one paragraph on each of these things. So each paragraph has both of the things you want to compare, but only one specific part of both things. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like you have a big ball of stuff. You can cut it this way or you can cut it that way. It's your choice. So that's the main body, and we will look at some examples of both styles. Finally, let's talk about the introduction. The introduction is where you tell your reader why you are comparing these two things. There are a number of reasons why someone might want to compare two things in the same essay. One reason is to show how two things that look similar are in fact very different. So in this situation, you're first, you would first talk about how they are similar, and then you would talk about how they are different. Another reason is that you want to take two things that look very different and show how they are similar. Right, it's the opposite of the first reason. Sometimes you want to write a comparison contrast essay to introduce something new by comparing it to something familiar. So you want to introduce something to the reader. To help them understand this thing, you compare it to something else that the reader already understands. So those are the three most common reasons why someone would write a comparison contrast essay. In your introduction, please tell the reader why you are writing this essay which is also why they might want to read your essay. 
then in the main body, do the comparing and contrasting. And in the conclusion, send your reader into the future, having learned something or having changed within themselves. That's the theory. Do you have questions? Great, let's take a look at the example essays. This is a chapter from a different textbook, and it has four example essays. So we're going to look at all four. This one, Conversational Ball Games by Nancy Masterson Sakamoto. Uh, the introduction tells you what this essay is about, and it's comparing two different kinds of conversation style. American and Japanese. After I was married and had lived in Japan for a while, my Japanese gradually improved to the point where I could take part in simple conversations with my husband, his friends, and his family. So the author is relatively new to Japan. She is more familiar with the American style of conversation. And I began to notice that often when I joined in, the others would look startled and the conversational topic would come to a halt. So often when she tries to join a conversation, people look surprised and the conversation stops. After this happened several times, it became clear to me that I was doing something wrong, but for a long time I didn't know what it was. Finally, after listening carefully to many Japanese conversations, I discovered what my problem was. Even though I was speaking Japanese, I was handling the conversation in a Western way. So that's the introduction part. Why is the author writing this essay? She wants to find out what she's doing wrong. Specifically, she's going to compare the Japanese and Western ways of conversation. Japanese style conversations develop quite differently from Western style conversations. And the difference isn't only in the languages. I realized that just as I kept trying to hold Western style conversations, even when I was speaking Japanese, so my English students kept trying to hold Japanese style conversations even when they were speaking English. We were unconsciously playing entirely different conversational ball games. So this third paragraph is also part of the introduction. It introduces the main idea that conversations are like ball games, and that Western style and Japanese style conversations are two different ball games. I really like this sentence. This is a gorgeous sentence. I realized that, and then starting from here, this is an inverted parallelism. This is Dao Zhuang Pai Bi. Right? I kept trying to hold Western style with Japanese. They kept trying to hold Japanese style with English. And it's held together by this sentence structure. Just as A, so B. In Chinese, we call this 就像 A, 同样的 B. Great sentence. Okay, so these three paragraphs introduce the essay. What we're going, why she wrote the essay. Um, what the main comparison is and how she is going to talk about these ideas. A Western style conversation. So she's starting with the Western style. This is the one that she is more familiar with. In order to learn about something that is new for the author, it is Japanese style conversation. Uh, she is starting from something that is more familiar. A Western style conversation between two people is like a game of tennis, Wang Cho. If I introduce a topic, a conversational ball, 
I expect you to hit it back. If you agree with me, I don't expect you simply to agree and do nothing more. I expect you to add something, a reason for agreeing, another example, or an elaboration to carry the idea further. But I don't expect you always to agree. I'm just as happy if you question me or challenge me or completely disagree with me. Whether you agree or disagree, your response will return the ball to me. And then it is my turn again. I don't serve a new ball from my original starting line. I hit your ball back again from where it has bounced. I carry your idea further or answer your questions or objections or challenge or question you. And so the ball goes back and forth with each of us doing our best to give it a new twist, an original spin or a powerful smash. And the more vigorous the action, the more interesting and exciting the game. Of course, if one of us gets angry, it spoils the conversation, just as it spoils a tennis game. But getting excited is not at all the same as getting angry. After all, we're not trying to hit each other. We're trying to hit the ball. So long as we attack only each other's opinions and do not attack each other personally, we don't expect anyone to get hurt. A good conversation is supposed to be interesting and exciting. If there are more than two people in the conversation, then it is like doubles in tennis, shuangda, or like volleyball, paichou. There's no waiting in line. Whoever is nearest and quickest hits the ball. And if you step back, someone else will hit it. No one stops the game to give you a turn. You're responsible for taking your own turn. But whether it's two players or a group, everyone does his best to keep the ball going, and no one person has the ball for very long. So these paragraphs are describing the Western style of conversation. It looks like this essay is going to use the first strategy, all about the first thing and then all about the second thing. So what does it say? First, it gives us a uh, what the so if I say something, the first the paragraph four is about what the other person should say in response. Paragraph five is about what I should say to respond to the other person. Paragraph six gives us this key idea. Getting excited is not at all the same as getting angry. These are very these are both very uh, energetic emotions. According to the author, the difference is that getting excited is trying to hit the ball. But if you try to hit each other, that is getting angry. In other words, in a Western style conversation, as long as you are talking about the topic, you can say whatever you want. But if you start talking about the person, then you have to be careful. Paragraph seven tells us what happens when there's more than two people in the conversation. And then paragraph eight gives us the main idea about Western style conversations. The point is to keep the ball going. The point is to keep the conversation going. So that's the Western style. Now let's look at how the author describes a Japanese style conversation. A Japanese style conversation, however, is not at all like tennis or volleyball. It's like bowling, bowling cho. You wait for your turn. And you always know your place in line. It depends on such things as whether you are older or younger, a close friend or a relative stranger to the previous speaker, in a senior or junior position, and so on. 
So already we have a difference. It is not like tennis or volleyball. Instead, you have to wait for your turn. And in the Western style conversation, you can only you should only talk about the topic, not about the person. But here it says that when you talk in a Japanese style conversation, depends on your relation to the other people. So already there is a big difference. When your turn comes, you step up to the starting line with your bowling ball and carefully bowl it. Everyone else stands back and watches politely, murmuring encouragement. Everyone waits until the ball has reached the end of the alley and watches to see if it knocks down all the pins or only some of them or none of them. There's a pause while everyone registers your score. Then, after everyone is sure that you have completely finished your turn, the next person in line steps up to the same starting line with a different ball. He doesn't return your ball, and he doesn't begin from where your ball stopped. There's no back and forth at all. All the balls run parallel, and there's always a suitable pause between turns. There's no rush, no excitement, no scramble for the ball. So paragraph nine talks about when to know to talk. Or how to know when to talk. Paragraph 10 tells you what to do when you talk. And paragraph 11 tells you what other people do when you talk. Uh, and what happens when the next person talks. And at the end of paragraph 11, the author compares Japanese style back with Western style. There's no rush, no excitement, no scramble for the ball. OK, so we already have our first big thing and our second big thing. So what else does this essay have to do? Well, the author then tries to put these two things together. No wonder everyone looked startled when I took part in Japanese conversations. I paid no attention to whose turn it was and kept snatching the ball halfway down the alley and throwing it back at the bowler. Of course the conversation died. I was playing the wrong game. So 12 is about what happens when you use a Western style conversation. When you try to use a Western style of conversation. When you the conversation is actually Japanese style. This explains why it is almost impossible to get a Western style conversation or discussion going with English students in Japan. I used to think that the problem was their lack of English language ability. But I finally came to realize that the biggest problem is that they too are playing the wrong game. Whenever I serve a volleyball, everyone just stands back and watches it fall with occasional murmurs of encouragement. No one hits it back. Everyone waits until I call on someone to take a turn. And when that person speaks, he doesn't hit my ball back. He serves a new ball. Again, everyone just watches it fall. So I call on someone else. This person does not refer to what the previous speaker has said. He also serves a new ball. Nobody seems to have paid any attention to what anyone else has said. Everyone begins again from the same starting line and all the balls run parallel. There's never any back and forth. Everyone is trying to bowl with a volleyball. So these three paragraphs explain what happens when Japanese style speakers take part in a Western style conversation. And then the last two paragraphs are the conclusion. Now that you know, right now that you know, so 
what are you going to do with this knowledge? Now that you know about, uh, about the difference in the conversational ball games, you may think that all your troubles are over. But if you have been trained all your life to play one game, it is no uh, simple matter to switch to another, even if you know the rules. Knowing the rules is not at all the same thing as playing the game. So this paragraph is actually kind of special. It assumes that you, the reader, think that the conclusion will ask you to go out and try having a different style conversation. But in fact, this paragraph is saying it's not that easy. Even if you know the rules, it's hard to follow a different set of rules. It takes lots of effort and practice. So that's not the real conclusion. That's not what the author really wants you to do. Even now, during a conversation in Japanese, I will notice a startled reaction and belatedly realize that once again, I have rudely interrupted by instinctively trying to hit back the other person's bowling ball. Belatedly means late, after the fact. It is no easier for me to just listen during a conversation than it is for my Japanese students to just relax when speaking with foreigners. Now I can truly sympathize with how hard they must find it to carry on a Western style conversation. So the true conclusion is it, the author wants the reader, you, to sympathize, to understand 同理同情, with people who face this problem. They learn how to have conversations one way, but now they have to use another way. Even if we can't change our instincts about conversation, we can at least be sympathetic and considerate of other people's situations. So again, the structure is very clear. First three paragraphs are the introduction, telling us why the author wrote this essay, what this essay is going to talk about, and how the essay will talk about the topic. Paragraphs four to eight are about Western style conversations. Nine to 11 are about Japanese style conversations. Paragraph 12 is about a Westerner trying to have Japanese style conversations. And paragraphs 13 to 15 are about Japanese people trying to have Western style conversations. 16 and 17 are the conclusion. 16 tells you maybe you can't immediately change your conversation style. But paragraph 17 says you at least can sympathize with people who are facing these kinds of situations. Good essay. Do you have questions? Over that quiet. No? OK, so let's move on to the next essay. This one. Home ground schoolyard, a double life. When you see this title, you already know it's going to be a comparison contrast essay. It's a double life, two lives. Therefore, the author will want to compare them. By Daria Muse. So this essay is about the author who is a black woman. Uh, she grew up in a black neighborhood, but she went to school in a white neighborhood. And so this essay is about how she had to learn to behave differently in her own neighborhood and at school. During my elementary and middle school years, I was a well-behaved, friendly student at school and a tough, hard-nosed bad girl in my neighborhood. So the first sentence gives us the comparison of this essay. Good kid at school, bad kid at home. This contrast in behavior was a survival tool, for I lived in a part of South Central Los Angeles where goody-goodies aren't tolerated, and I attended school in Northridge, where troublemakers aren't tolerated. 
So this sentence explains why uh, there was this difference, and it is because the two places have directly opposite expectations of her. In her community, she is expected to be one way, but at school, she is expected to be the exact opposite way. So she had to learn to uh, present as two different people. Beckford Avenue Elementary School was in the heart of middle class suburbia. And I, coming from what has been described as the urban jungle, was bused there every day for six years. OK, so this is the setting of the essay. The school is in middle class suburbs, but the author's neighborhood is in the urban jungle. So to go to school, she had to take a bus uh, across school district lines. Has a kwashre chu jochre. That it was a privilege for kids like us to be bused to a good school like Beckford was drummed into our heads by our teachers and principal so as to induce us, the bus kids, into behaving like the young ladies and gentlemen they wanted us to be instead of the uncontrollable delinquents they thought we were. So this sentence is telling us a lot of different things. First of all, every day her teachers and principal would repeatedly tell them until they remembered that for kids like the author to have the privilege to to go to a school like Beckford. It's such a privilege. And the reason they did they kept repeating this is they wanted to change us. They called us the bus kids. From uncontrollable delinquents, delinquents is uh, wanted to change us into the young ladies and gentlemen that they wanted us to be. Instead of the delinquents that they thought we were. This is a beautiful sentence. I love this sentence so much. Every part of this sentence is flipping between the two worlds. Uh, so it was a privilege. So this is the white world. Kids like us, this is the black world. Good school like Beckford is the white world. To transform us, bus kids, this is the black world. Young ladies and gentlemen they wanted us to be. This is the white world. Uncontrollable delinquents they thought we were. This is the black world. So the entire spirit of comparison in this essay can be found in this one sentence. Both sides alternating throughout the sentence. It's also a marvel of grammar, beautiful grammar. It was a privilege for kids like us to be bused to a good school like Beckford. This is the subject. This is Zhu Ci. It is a complete sentence used as the subject of a sentence. It is a complete sentence used as a noun, and this noun is the subject of the sentence. And you can tell that this is one noun because it is preceded by the word that. That plus a complete sentence turns this sentence into a noun. The verb was drummed into our heads, repeated and repeated until we remembered. By our teachers and principal. Why did they do this? Because they wanted to take. Uh, us, the bus kids, this is what the teachers called them, the bus kids. And they wanted to make us the young ladies and gentlemen that they wanted us to be. And this idea is compared to the idea of what they thought we actually were, which is uncontrollable delinquents. Right, and the comparison is instead of. So this sentence is telling us that the teachers and principal wanted to change these black kids 
and make them behave like white people. But the structure of the sentence is also mixing together these two ideas. The sentence reflects the idea, right? The language expresses the same idea as the content. Beautiful writing. In a roundabout way, which means indirect. I was told from the first day of school that if I wanted to continue my privileged attendance in the hallowed, which means sacred, sensenda, classrooms of Beckford, I would have to conform and adapt to their standards. I guess I began to believe all that they said because slowly I began to conform. These two sentences are also very good. The teachers tell her that she has to conform, and so slowly she began to conform. Repetition emphasizes the idea. It brings together these two worlds. So the first paragraph introduces the essay. The second paragraph gives us the background. Why did it become like this? And the answer is because the school wanted her to become a different person at school. Instead of wearing the tight jeans and T-shirt that were the style in South Central at the time, I wore schoolgirl dresses like those of my female classmates. I even changed my language. When asking a question, instead of saying, boy, give me those scissors before I knock you up your head in school, I asked, Excuse me, would you please hand me the scissors? When giving a compliment in school, I'd say, you look very nice today, instead of, girl, who do you think you are dressing so fine, Miss Thang? So this paragraph is making a direct comparison between the two worlds in the clothing that she wore and the language that she used. 那个黑人英文需要我翻译吗 ？So this sentence means, "Give me those scissors before I hit you." 就请他交过来，不然我打你哦。And this sentence says, "Why are you dressed so special? Who do you think you are?" And Chinese would be, "You 穿这么好看干嘛？你以为谁啊？" So immediately you can feel the difference between the two cultures. This confirmation of my appearance and speech won me the acceptance of my proper classmates at Beckford Avenue Elementary School. But after getting out of the school bus and stepping onto the sidewalks of South Central, my appearance quit being an asset and became a dangerous liability. So an asset is something that is worth money, and a liability is something that you owe money to someone else. So asset, 资产 liability, 负债 This white behavior in her neighborhood turned from an asset into a liability, and it was a dangerous liability. One day, when I got off the school bus, a group of tough girls who looked as though they were part of a gang approached me, looked at my pink and white lace dress, and accused me of trying to look white. I have to say, she's wearing a pink and white lace dress. 粉红兼白色蕾丝洋装 I do think she was trying to look white. They surrounded me and demanded a response that would prove to them that I was still loyal to my black heritage or black culture. I screamed, lay off me, girls, or I'll bust you in the eyes so bad that you'll need a telescope just to see. Uh, again, this means stop harassing me or I will hit you very hard. The girls walked away without causing any more trouble. So this paragraph is describing the danger that could arise 
because the author is presenting herself in two very different ways. From then on, two personalities emerged. I began living a double life. At school, I was prim and proper in appearance and speech. But during the drive on the school bus from Northridge to South Central, my other personality emerged. Once I got off the bus, I put a black jacket over my dress. I hardened my face and roughened my speech to show everyone who looked my way that I was not a girl to be messed with. I led this double life throughout my six years of elementary school. So paragraph five is a response to paragraph four. If presenting the wrong side of herself caused danger, then in paragraph five, she learned how to switch between the two sides of herself, depending on where she was. Now that I'm older and can look back at that time objectively, I don't regret displaying contrasting behavior in the two different environments. It was for my survival. So in this conclusion, the first sentence, she is responding to what she assumes the audience might be thinking. She assumes the audience might be thinking, oh, that's terrible or how weird. But she says she does not regret this because it was for her survival. She had to. Daria, the hard nosed bad girl, survived in the urban jungle and Daria, the well behaved student, survived in the suburbs. As a teenager in high school, I still displayed different personalities. I act one way in school, which is different from the way I, I act with my parents, which is different from the way I act with my friends, which is different from the way I act in religious services or church. But don't we all? We all put on character masks for our different roles in life. All people are guilty of acting differently at work than at play and differently with coworkers than with the boss. There's nothing wrong with having different personalities to fit different situations. The trick or the key is knowing the real you from the characters. So in this conclusion, not only does she say that she had to do this to survive, she continues to say that everybody does something similar, right? Don't we all? We all do something similar. So her situation is not strange. It is not weird. It's simply more extreme than uh, most people's situations. So let's look back at the structure of this essay. First paragraph introduces the comparison and explains the difference between the two terms. The second paragraph explains how this difference first arose. The third paragraph gives us a direct comparison in clothing and language. Paragraph four tells us that it could be dangerous to present the wrong side of herself in the wrong place. And so paragraph five tells us how the author learned to present the correct person in the correct place. Paragraph six, as a conclusion, asks the reader to think back on their own life and situations where the reader also presents different uh, personalities in different situations. So what does the author want the reader to take away from this essay? The author wants the reader to be more aware of how they live their life. To be more aware of the different ways that people present themselves to different people in different situations. OK, do you have questions about this one? So. Um, let's look at there are two more essays. The other two essays are example student essays. 
my two brothers. Again, this title calls out for comparison. No two people are exactly alike. And my two older brothers, Nan and Hong, are no exceptions. OK, so that tells us the two people that will be compared are both older brothers. When I think of them, I think of Rudyard Kipling's words. Uh, Kipling, Jiboring, is a British poet. East is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. Twain means two. Even though they have the same parents, there are considerable differences in looks, personality, and attitude toward life reflect the differences between Eastern and Western cultures. So paragraph two tells us that we will be looking at three points of comparison. Appearance, personality, and attitude toward life. And that one brother will be more Eastern and the other brother will be more Western. Like the majority of Asian men, Nan is short, small, and has a full moon-shaped face. His smooth white skin and small arms and feet make him look somewhat delicate, Jingzi. Nan always likes to wear formal, traditional clothes. For example, on great holidays or at family rite celebrations, rite is ritual, yi si. Nan appears in the traditional black gown, white pants, and black silky headband, all of which make him look like an early 20th century intellectual. In contrast to Nan, so there's a comparison, right? Unlike Nan, Hung, who is his younger brother by 10 years, looks more like an American boxer, Chen Ji So. He is tall. Muscular, which means he has a lot of muscles, and and big boned. He is built straight as an arrow, and his face is long and angular as a Western character. Unlike Nan, Hung has strong feet and arms, and whereas Nan has smooth skin, Hung's shoulders and chest are hairy, large, and full. Unlike Nan too, Hung likes to wear comfortable t-shirts and jeans or sports clothes. At a formal occasion, instead of wearing traditional formal clothes, Hung wears stylish Western style suits. So notice that after introducing the first brother, when talking about the second brother, the author keeps comparing the two brothers, making sure to remind the reader that this is a comparison essay. So that's the appearance. Next, it should be personality. Nan and Hung also differ in personality. I don't know how my father selected their names correctly to reflect their personalities. Nan's name means patience. And his patience is shown in his smile. He has the smile of an ancient Chinese philosopher that Western people can never understand. He always smiles. He smiles because he wants to make the other person happy or to make himself happy. He smiles whenever people speak to him, regardless of whether they are right or wrong. He smiles when he forgives people who have wronged him. Nan likes books, of course, and literature and philosophy. He likes to walk in the moonlight to think. Nan also enjoys drinking hot tea and singing verses. In short, in our family, Nan is the son who provides a good example of filial piety and tolerance. Filial piety is Xiao Dao. Hung on the other hand, does not set a good example of traditional respectful behavior for his brothers and sisters. His name means strength, but his strength is self-centered. 
As a result, unlike Nan, Hung only smiles when he is happy. When he talks to people, he looks at their faces. Because of this, my eldest brother Nan considers him very impolite. As one might expect, Hung does not like philosophy and literature. Instead, he studies science and technology. Whereas Nan enjoys tea and classical verses, Hung prefers to sunbathe, Ri Guang Yu, and drink Coca Cola while he listens to rock and roll music. And like many American youths, Hung is independent. In fact, he loves his independence more than he loves his family. He wants to move out of our house and live in an apartment by himself. He's such an individualist that all the members in my family say that he is very selfish. So again, on this uh, personality point, first non, then hung. So we're going point by point. And the last one is, uh, I think, attitude toward life. My brother's differences do not end with their looks and personalities. Concerning their attitudes toward life, they are as different as the moon and the sun. My eldest brother, Nan, is concerned with spiritual values. He is affected by Confucian, Taoist, and Buddhist theories. Taoist is uh, Dao Jia. These theories suggest that the human life is not happy. Therefore, if a man wants to be happy, he should get out of the competitiveness of life and should not depend on material objects. For example, if a man is not anxious to have a new model car, he does not have to worry about how to make money to buy one. And if he does not have a car, he does not have to worry about the cost of gas. My older brother is deeply affected by these theories, so he never tries hard to make money to buy conveniences. In contrast to Nan, my brother Hung believes that science and technology serve human beings and that the West defeated the East because the West was further advanced in these fields. Therefore, each person must compete with nature and with other people in the world in order to acquire different conveniences such as cars, washing machines, and television sets. Hung is affected by the Western theories of real values. Consequently, he always works hard to make his own money to satisfy his material needs. Notice that the first example for Hung is cars, which is the same example chosen for none, right? A car. The fact that the first example for Hung is the same that we just saw for none, they're both the difference on the same object makes us think about that difference. It emphasizes the contrast between the two brothers, the different ways that they think about the same object. Uh, let's take a short break and we'll read and talk about the conclusion uh, after the break.
OK, let's look at the conclusion of this essay. So we've looked at the appearance, personality and attitude toward life of the two brothers. What does the author want the reader to take away? In accordance with the morality of the culture of my country, I cannot say which one of my brothers is wrong or right. But I do know that they both want to improve and maintain human life on this earth. I am very lucky to inherit both sources of thought from my two older brothers. So it looks like what the author really wants the reader to know is that they are very lucky to have both. Uh, so that it is in fact a good thing that the author can experience both kinds of culture in the same family. Um, now the author says they cannot say which brother is better. But I think that the first sentence gives us a clue. Because the author says in accordance with my culture's morality. So the author is following their own traditional culture. That makes the author closer to none, the Eastern brother. Right? Seems like they might agree on this point. So even though the author says they can't choose, the author seems to have secretly chosen already. This is also an important skill to be able to read between the lines. The author says one thing, but maybe the author is thinking something else. In fact, this is one of the main reasons why learning English is so important. Every day people try to tell you things. The news, the, your teacher, your parents, your boss, they all try to tell you things. But they may be trying to say something else in addition to the information that they give you. And it's very important to be able to understand the second layer of meaning on top of uh, what they are directly trying to tell you. So this is also an essay with a very clear structure. Introduction, two paragraphs introduce the topic and tells you what will happen in this essay. Paragraphs three and four are about appearances. First, non, then hung. Five and six are about personality. First, non, then hung. Seven and eight are about attitude toward life. First, non, then hung. And then paragraph nine, conclusion. Very clear structure. Do you have questions about this essay? OK, let's look at the fourth essay. And then after this, we'll do some grammar practice. My favorite. My old neighborhood. This title is also a very comparative title. My old neighborhood, so it's not my current neighborhood. Or maybe it's the same neighborhood after a long time. Either way, there are two things in this title. And so it's likely that this essay will try to compare these two things. Several years ago, I returned to Washington, D.C. and visited one of my old neighborhoods. I had not been on Nass Street for more than 20 years. And as I walked along the street, my mind was flooded by waves of nostalgia. So yes, indeed, the author, after a long time, has come back to their original neighborhood. I saw the old apartment building where I had lived and the playground where I had played. As I viewed these once familiar surroundings, images of myself as a child there came to mind. However, what I saw and what I remembered were not the same. I sadly realized that the best memories are those left undisturbed. So this is the comparison between what the author saw and what the author remembered. 
And in fact, the author already gives us the conclusion of this essay. The, the idea that the author wants the reader to take away is that the best memories are left undisturbed. As I remember my old apartment building, it was bright and alive. So we're starting from memory first. When I was a child, the apartment building was more than just a place to live. It was a medieval castle, a pirate's den, a space station, or whatever my young mind could imagine. I would steal away with my friends and play in the basement. This was always exciting because it was so cool and dark, and there were so many things there to hide among. Uh, so here the word cool does not mean like, oh, it's so cool. Cool here means kind of cold, not very cold, but just kind of cold. Our favorite place to play was the coal bin. We would always use it as our rocket ship because the coal chute could be used as an escape hatch out of the basement into outer space. So um, in case you don't know, some older houses um, still have the design for burning coal for energy. And so how that works is um, there would be like a, a coal salesman or a truck that would come around and sell coal. And if you buy coal from them, they will take the coal and they will dump it into a chute. Uh, and the chute will go directly to the basement into the coal bin. And so they didn't have to move the coal into the basement. They could just dump it and it would go in. Uh, and in the basement is where you would burn the coal for central heating. So this house probably, or this apartment probably does not rely on coal. It's probably just an older design that's left there um, after improvements have been made. All of my memories were not confined to the apartment building, however. I have many memory, I have memories of many adventures outside of the building also. Aha, so this essay is going to first talk all about memory and then move into all about what the author sees today. The previous paragraph was about the apartment building. This paragraph is about outside of the building. My mother restricted how far we could go from the apartment building, but this placed no restrictions on our exploring instinct. There was a small branch, Xiaoxiliu, in back of the building where my friends and I would play. In back of here just means behind. We enjoyed it there because honeysuckles grew there, uh, Jinginghua. We would go there to lie in the shade and suck the sweet smelling honeysuckles. Our biggest thrill in the branch was the day the police caught an alligator there. I did not see the alligator and I was not there when they caught it, but just the thought of an alligator in the branch was exciting. This is how I remember the old neighborhood. However, as I said, this is not how it was when I saw it again. So paragraph four is a transition. It brings us from memory into reality. Picture. OK. Unlike the apartment building I remembered, this one was now run down and in disrepair. So we're also going in the same order. First building and then outside the building. What was once more than a place to live looked hardly worth living in. This is also a good sentence. 曾经看起来不只是一个居住的地方，现在看起来快要不能住了。The court was dirty and broken up. The court is the empty space in front of the building, and the windows of the building were all broken out. 
The once clean walls were covered with graffiti and other stains. Graffiti is painting on the wall. There were no medieval knights or pirates running around the place now, nor spacemen. Instead, there were a few tough looking adolescents, Qing Saonian, who looked much older than their ages. As for the area where I used to play, it was hardly recognizable. The branch was polluted and the honeysuckles had died. Not only were they dead, but they had been trampled to the ground. The branch itself was filled with old bicycles, broken bottles, and garbage. Now, instead of finding something as romantic as an alligator, one would expect to find only rats. The once sweet smelling area now smelled horrible. The stench, which is the stink, from my idyllic haven was heart wrenching. I do not regret having seen my old neighborhood. However, I do not think my innocent childhood memories can ever be the same. I suppose it's true when they say you can never go home again. So the conclusion, what does the author want the reader to take away from this essay? What does the author want the reader to learn? Well, in this essay, first you have the introduction uh, telling us what is the reason the author is writing this essay, like what is the background, and then what is the essay going to compare? Paragraphs two and three are about memory. Two is inside the building, three is outside the building. Paragraph four is a transition, zhuanzi. Five and six are about the reality today, inside the building, outside the building. And seven is the conclusion. Now, the author says that his child, or I guess their childhood memories will never be the same. Seeing the reality of this neighborhood today has ruined the author's childhood memories. This is not a good situation. So in the conclusion, the author is trying to find the meaning of this experience. It's such a terrible experience. What can I learn from this? What importance is there in this experience? And the author finds meaning in the fact that it is. Uh, the same for everyone. It is a universal experience. Everybody will face something similar. When you go back to your old childhood home, things will never be exactly the same, and often things will be slightly worse. So in this conclusion, the author is kind of comforting himself and telling the reader that this is going to happen to basically everybody. Uh, so it's not a big tragedy. It's just something normal. And perhaps you should know about it and be prepared for it. Uh, and that goes back to the um, idea in the end of the first paragraph. The best memories are left undisturbed. OK, do you have questions about this essay? OK, so we have seen four examples of comparison contrast essays um, using both structures, right? All of one, all of the other or point by point. When you decide what you want to write, I recommend that you write from personal experience. Write about something that you care about. Compare something that you really want to compare. I know that some of you go online to look for essay topics. And that's fine. But I've seen those topics. I know those essays. When I read them, they're kind of boring. But if you write about something you care about, you will try, naturally, you will try to get it right. You will try to make it make sense. And I can feel that energy in your writing. So I encourage you to think about something that you want to compare. Maybe 
two things that are similar but actually not the same, two things that are different but actually very similar, something like that. Uh, write about something you care about. It'll make for a much more interesting and even fun writing experience. Now, you know that it is very important to be able to catch your own mistakes, right? Because if you can't catch your own mistakes, you can't fix them. Let's practice. OK, this one. OK, let's do this one. There are. 12 mistakes in this paragraph. Five of them have to do with comparison adjectives, bijiaoji. Four of them have to do with subject verb agreement, danfu shu tongxing. Three of them have to do with verb forms, dong si xing shi. Let's see how many you can catch in 10 minutes. And then we'll compare answers. Actually, I should tell you, the textbook says that there are um, 12 mistakes. There are actually 15 mistakes. If you can catch 12, uh, I'll let you pass the course, no questions. 10 minutes.
Okay, let's compare answers. Did anyone catch all 15? Did anyone catch 14? Jeffrey, you got 14. Would you like to share with the class? Don't worry about it. Please come uh, on stage and point out what you found for us. Hop on, hop on. Sorry, would you mind standing on the other side? Thank you. Yes, different -er. Indeed, this is wrong. What is the correct form? More different. Good. Okay, next. So, so, sorry, what, before you continue, hang on. Uh, did anyone get 13? 12? 11? You got two, great. Anyone get 10? Nine? Eight. You got eight, okay, great. So you can also compare to see if you guys found the same ones. Sorry, yes, please, next one. Sits. Ah, I regret to inform you this is American English. Yeah, in American English, groups of people are singular. Yeah, so the, in British English, this would be wrong. In British English, groups of people are plural. Uh, no matter, please continue. Yes, they do not dance or talk. Right, good. And? Yes, this should be better. I'm sure most of you found this one, hopefully. OK, and then? Uh, again, yeah. right. So again, this is groups of people. So uh, singular in American, plural in British. Please continue. This one, yes. right? Begin is not a word. This should be began, a n. Ah, yes, this is wrong because the subject is musicians, more than one. So this should be point, no s. Uh, 
I, I think this is referring to the 18th century, so were is correct. Yes, throwed is not a word. This should be through, E-W, good. Yes, uh, although it should be manners. Manners are not. Right, manners is plural. This should be are. OK, good correction. Yes, passionate is not a word. This should be less passionate. Actually, no, the subject is appreciation. Appreciation for A and B, so it should be is that that is correct. Right, this is wrong. They is plural, though, so this should be show, not shows. OK, good, thank you. So I think if we look at it in terms of American English, you got 11. Yeah, almost there. Good job. Thank you. So let's look at the or I guess maybe you got 10 because there are two that. Hang on. Yeah, you got 11. You got 11. There are a few more that you missed. Uh, so let's see. This is the first mistake. First time attendee. First time should have a hyphen. Because it's one word, one adjective. Um, let's see. The, the, the another one that Jeffrey didn't get is this one. The attire at a classical music concert is as formal as the clothing at a rock concert is informal. So it's as a as it's as adjective as something, right? So go to Xing Shui Guo as din din as din din din. So it's comparing. OK, the, the the logic you need to think about this. It's comparing the degree of formality and informality. In Chinese. OK. Um, here, shouting, pushing, and jumping are, it's three things, are common as well. Uh, this one. This should be T O O. Um, because it says neither audience is less passionate. So both are passionate, right? Neither is less. Uh, so it's both are. Therefore, the second one is also positive. So positive and positive. So this should be two. Uh, and in fact, there should be a comma before the two. If you put T-O-O -O at the end of a sentence, there should be a comma before the word two. Yeah, so I think that's 15. More or less. Right, so this practice tells us that it's usually not easy to find mistakes of grammar. And this is because when we read, we very. When we read, we very instinctively read for content. We want to know what it means. Reading for grammar uses a completely different side of our brain. So it takes practice. Even if you don't understand what the sentence is saying. 
you can still find if the grammar is correct or not. Most of the mistakes and the rules we talked about, as soon as I talked about it, you knew what I was saying. You know the rules. You just didn't notice that it was wrong. So that's the part that we need to practice more. Um, and so I usually give the advice that when you're checking your own work for grammar mistakes, read it multiple times. Each time you read, focus on one kind of mistake. So maybe the first time you read, focus on spelling. And then the next time, for focus on subject verb agreement, dan fu shu. Then the next time, focus on verb forms, dong si yong dui bu dui. And then the next time, like focus on uh, the tense, present tense, past tense, si tai. Right? Uh, and the next time, focus on prepositions, jie ji ci. One thing at a time and read multiple times. That can help train your brain to focus on the grammar and not just the content or the ideas. Do you have questions? Okay. And you mentioned that if I teach the language in the next class, every class will use this question to train them. Will it be too tiring? Okay. 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 I encourage you to use this time to think about what you want to write for your comparison contrast essay. Um, and if today you did not manage to hand in your cause effect essay, I have posted on Moodle how to hand in a late essay. So Please try to hand in a paper copy to my department mailbox before Thursday fifth period. If you can't make Thursday fifth period, uh, Moodle, there will be a late submission space on Moodle, and you can hand in that uh, before class. But remember, the later you hand in your essay, the less time I have to mark it for you. So if you didn't manage to hand it in today, please try to hand it in as soon as you can, ASAP. Okay, that's it.